Today, uh, basically, uh, we have entered the realm of post-GE13. Uh, lots of people, I think, have, uh, are beginning to feel a little weary of the direction our politics is, is going towards uh, and are seeking more independent and more articulate and more reasoned and logical voices uh, to clarify uh, the situation. Uh, and I think Dr. Sion would be one of those um, very credible candidates to do so. So if I may begin the interview, uh, Dr. Sion, by really just kind of encapsulating, um, and this is not even a worst case scenario, it's just our real scenario. Uh, following post GE13, we've seen an increase in religious and racial, uh, um, not tension, but uh, you know, uh, uh, acrimony is the word I use in the questions. Uh, there seems to be a, a almost wanton use of Sedition Act and people are being arrested even for bathing dogs. Um, we see a heightened sense of sensitivity, which is uh, to many people being fueled by uh, the administration. And even something as, as, as frightening as an increase in gun crimes, firearm crimes. Um, and I put in my questions, I said a poet would describe it, a poet actually did describe it, uh, Yeats was the poet who said the center cannot hold, and the center doesn't seem to, to, to be able to hold. So uh, my question is very direct. Do you believe that we are a society in free fall? Well, I think to begin with, now, should we or should we not link the occurrence of all these issues, happenings to GE, to general election? I wouldn't say that the, you know, GE should be blamed in total, because generally everybody understands that GE, general election, is a test of a nation's political maturity. And in Malaysia, of course, to me, it is a real litmus test of our handling of the uh, complexity of our problems, especially we know very, very well that the multi-ethnic, multi-religious issues have been uh, mind-boggling, all this one. And, uh, at the same time, perhaps, perhaps when we talk about GE, let me talk about GE first before I uh, come to your questions. GE, general election. Now, certain quotas may argue that it is also a test of the respective parties' choice of priorities, whether you are only keen on winning the seats at all costs, or do you have a bigger picture in mind? that is to preserve the, the hard-earned uh, harmony and uh, cohesion within our social fabric. I think all these are the basic parameters that we need to deal with. And of, of course, on top of that, when uh, we talk about free, uh, a society in free fall, I think this, uh, this is a little bit too far-fetched because it depends on the political will political will of all our political players mm. from both sides of the divide mm. and not just confined to the establishment. Of course, everybody would tend to uh, train their guns mm. at those from the power, uh, corridors of power, mm. but suffice to say that even the other side of the divide, if they have, they should have a fair role to play, mm. right, in making this country a better place to live in. This is my, uh, my, my take, I mean, my gut feeling, because I don't believe in all those uh, so-called uh, uh, blind loyalty, especially mm -hmm. blind loyalty being uh, trumpeted uh, at the height of the electioneering. Uh, people, they, they would go for parties instead of, uh, uh, instead of going for quality candidates, mm -hmm. irrespective of the partisan affiliation, mm -hmm. you know, or even sometimes, you know, people, they, they, they tend to uh, adopt uh, multi-standards mm. in uh, judging the performance, the words and deeds mm. of politicians. Mm. And I, I must say that uh, we should, uh, common sense must prevail. We should come to a stage where uh, we should have a more discerning mind. Mm. Yeah? A logistic, uh, a what you call a log a logical, making a logical choice, of course, has never been easy. Mm. But to be discerning, to be a discerning uh, citizen or a voter, mm. I think is absolutely necessary mm. for Malaysians at this juncture. 
That, that's a, a key word to take on. You say that uh, an election shouldn't really be about just Prabhu Kusi, basically. Uh, and it shouldn't be about you know, uh, winning power uh, uh, at whatever cost. Yeah. Uh, and that there must be political will for yeah. reform. But that is precisely what the public is concerned about because there doesn't seem to be political will from either side of the divide to really commit themselves to reform. Uh, we've not even heard from the Prime Minister really since GE13. Uh, so aren't we in a situation where actually that is the case, that both parties are just struggling uh, for that point of power? Yep. Well, again, we need, we need to be more discerning on the definition of reform. The word reform seems to be trendy mm. to all quarters. Mm. It is a palatable word that everybody loves so much mm. without much understanding. Now, when we talk about reform, of course, we need to be more discerning. We need to ask, what kind of reform? Does he mean to say that the, uh, the, only, the only thing that we should do under the word reform is to have mere change of guards? Mm. I don't think that is sufficient. Mm. What is lacking now is change of mindset. Mm. Mindset not just among the politicians, but also among our people, mm. the voters themselves. We have been talking about, you know, you know the, the people are the ultimate bosses, mm. determining the destiny of the, mm. of the nation. But at the same time, have we ever done sufficient soul searching mm. by asking, mm. do we understand our rights before we talk about exercising our rights? I think this has been uh, uh, long neglected mm. by our people. Mm. I'm not trying to be philosophical, but then uh, this has been, uh, you know, something bo uh, really bothering my mind. Mm. Uh, not just before and after mm. GE 13, mm. but even before that. Mm. We have been talking about the same old issues again and again. Mm. And until today, I can, I can share with you that uh, by and large, a lot of our voters, including urban voters, mm. the more well-informed voters mm. in the urban areas, they don't seem to understand, mm. you know, what are the differences between, say, for instance, an MP mm. and a local councillor or, mm. uh, say, a state assemblyman. They can't even tell the difference. Mm. What more you expect from them? Mm. I think these are the, the basic things that we need to be more critical with. Political education then. Yeah. yeah. Political yeah. education, of course, demands greater political openness. But that's something I'll come back yeah. to you uh, in a bit. But when you're talking about uh, reform, or basically trying to articulate and shape that reform, yeah. uh, you know, one of the things that happened after 2008, uh, after the tsunami of March 8, 2008, was a pledge by the governing uh, coalition uh, that there would be introspection, that there would be a, you know, an attempt at, at some kind of self-discovery. Instead, again, you see internal fighting and an opportunity to create a push within the lead party. Uh, after GE13, which was an even greater hammering, you would expect a bit of, to put it very crudely, just a bit of humility. Instead, what you get is a prime minister on that very day uh, announcing that this was a Chinese tsunami and then later on saying, you know, we're dedicated to national reconciliation. Uh, and I think a large number of people are very confused because these are essentially contradictory terms and they seem to be irreconcilably contradictory. Uh, can you just tell me what your feelings were when you heard that announcement and what has subsequently happened? Uh, honestly, uh, well, at first, of course, I was quite taken aback by his remarks and I was asked, uh, what I think of his remarks, and as usual, I call a spade a spade, yes. uh, irrespective of a person's uh, status. Yeah. And I said, well, to me, it's a, it should be more absolutely described as urban tsunami. That was my, my take when uh, I first responded, uh, with due respect to, uh, to anybody, including the Prime Minister. But of course, I, uh, when I tried to understand uh, his remarks further. I, I could understand. I, I could understand the kind of frustration or disappointment in him uh, as the chairman of Barcelona National. Not that I'm, I'm trying to, uh, uh, I'm trying to justify uh, the correctness of making a such a statement, but rather, I could understand how frustrated he could be or disappointed with the level of support among the Chinese voters in favor of BN. Uh, in view that 
he had put in so much effort and resources mm. to woo the Chinese support mm. yeah, before the general election, mm. before GE 13. Mm. I couldn't understand. Mm. Nonetheless, that does not justify you know, mm. the, uh, uh, the utterance, mm. uh, such an utterance in the open. But at the same time, when we talk about national reconciliation, of course, I, mean, I must say that uh, uh, due credit has to be given. And uh, certainly this, this is something pertinent and relevant. Mm. We need to have national reconciliation, mm. but uh, unfortunately I didn't see much elaboration mm. on the subject matter. Mm. Somehow or other, he just stopped at that. Mm. And uh, if I may elaborate a little bit further, national reconciliation is not just, aligned, uh, is not just along mm. the uh, racial lines mm. or religious lines, but also along the partisan lines. We need to see reconciliation between parties from both sides of the divide. I think that should be uh, viewed in total mm -hmm. and not just uh, you know, piecemeal. Mm. But that has been the problem with the Prime Minister, hasn't it? I mean, I've, I've said myself and in places like this very often that we perceive that Sri Najib essentially as being a, a highly intelligent, urbane individual. Uh, who has made very grand gestures. And surely, what I could never understand during that period of, of the pre-election campaigns was, surely you understand that you know, the resources you invest, uh, have invested in to the Chinese community and various others, will really be seen as vote buying by the voters, which was what happened. Uh, and uh, it seems that uh, Dato Najib's administration seems to be an administration of stuttering, in the sense that it makes a pledge and then puts a full top and nothing is nothing carries on. Uh, it's same with the national re reconciliation. It's announced and then there's no serious effort made towards national reconciliation. How the, can a public then take this administration seriously? Uh, well, I must say that in all fairness, it is still premature for us uh, to pass any judgment, final judgment, uh, on uh, um, this national reconciliation. Now, because I believe, I believe there should be a blueprint mm. for such a social engineering. It's not just a post-election kind of a social engineering, but rather mm. this should be a lifelong social engineering mm. in our country. It's not just confined to ah after GE 13 because of the tsunami we need to we need to uh, to do the uh, the repair so to speak. It's not that. Mm. It should be far more than that. Mm. So essentially, you're talking about the need to really go back to very fundamental basic yeah. things. Uh, everything from the political system, yeah. from the way parties are aligned, from the constitution and everything. Because the constitution really has become quite a ridiculous document with everyone interpreting it the way they want. Uh, because it allows us to do that. I mean, some of the phrases are, are very open-ended, so anyone can kind of read it the way it is. But you're basically talking about an entire process of national renewal. Yes, absolutely. And how do we go about it? National renewal certainly doesn't uh, it wouldn't be a success without participation of all parties, mm. meaning all parties across the mm. political divide, as well as the people. Mm. I don't believe that uh, the destiny of the, of the nation uh, is going to be determined only by the politicians, mm. or maybe the big-time politicians from the corridors of power. Mm. The people must have a say. Mm. But how to express how to, mm. to express our own, um, our, what they call our aspirations, mm. uh, that is the major challenge. How to make ourselves heard. Yes. I think that is, uh, is indeed you know, a very challenging, uh, mm. challenging issue. Mm. Because at this juncture, of course, everybody say that, I mean, all the big time politicians, they would argue that, well, we listen to the people. Mm. We are prepared to listen. Mm. But the question is, how are you going to translate that, mm. the people's aspiration, into deeds, into action? Mm. That remains to be seen. Mm. Yeah. Uh, because one of the things that really struck me, and you know, we don't have time. We don't have time because the world is rapidly changing yeah. around us. Uh, you know, the ringgit has slid 8% uh, in the past uh, uh, two weeks. Uh, most Asian currencies have slid, but you know, the ringgit gets especially bad when Asian currencies uh, slide. It's been 8%. We have things like the TTPA to look forward to. Uh, we have things like ASEAN integration in 2015 to look forward to. Instead, uh, during the period of election campaigning, 
uh, we were listening to the same old rubbish of smut and sex videos and you know all these kinds of stuff. Uh, and uh, um, one of my great concerns is uh, really our system, and we don't have a choice here because we're going to be greatly marginalized if this doesn't happen. I mean the media, I know. I mean, uh, eventually if you look at uh, international media, um, Malaysia is regarded increasingly in marginal terms, as this is not a country worth bothering looking at because it's a bit of a joke, really, is, is the common uh, um, idea. Uh, but, um, you know, as we face all of these things, we are constantly insulating ourselves. Uh, how do you suggest that we grapple with this kind of element? Uh, of course, we are, no, we are not in, in a comfortable or enviable position. I, I understand. Now, these are due to, uh, this is due to the accumulative effect. Now, of all these challenging issues over the years, over the decades, mm -hmm. nonetheless, we should also acknowledge the fact that the country is currently uh, at the transition point of time, mm -hmm. meaning on one hand, now we need to grapple with the uh, deeply entrenched uh, mindsets mm -hmm. of uh, ethnic and uh, religious bigotry. I use the word bigotry. And on top of that, on the other hand, of course, now we are yearning for changes mm. uh, with the onslaught of uh, the new media, mm. uh, the uh, dissemination of information and disinformation at the same time mm. through the me through the uh, new media, mm. right? Certainly, we are yearning for changes. Mm. But what kind of changes we are expecting? Of course, I think there's no such thing as uh, single answers. Now we all want changes. But many a time when we ask the people at large, they don't seem to have the answer. Mm. I think that is the, you know, the, uh, one of the points that uh, we should look at mm. uh, seriously. Mm. Of course, we would expect the government to be more open, right? But at the same time, the opposition, I, I would always say that the opposition, they do have their role to play mm. at all times. Mm. But how about the people? Mm. The people, in fact, they are the one. Mm. They are the masters. Mm. They are the masters. And the politicians are just mere servants, mm. serving them. Mm. And uh, and uh, I could foresee that I could foresee that whoever mm. running the country at this juncture, mm. certainly uh, they are going to hand, uh, they are going to have their hands full mm. at this juncture. I agree with what you observe, mm. and uh, certainly mm. these are no easy task mm. uh, for them to to clear up mm. under the present situation. But I, I got to pin you down on this because it seems that the politician is now blaming the people and not the other way around. Uh, I, and I said, yeah, as, just, as a citizen, let me reply your, 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 your question. Um, I get my voice heard through the media. I get my voice heard through institutions. I get my voice heard through representatives. All of those channels are compromised in this country. So where do I get my voice heard? Ultimately, in the ballot box. And even then, nobody wants to hear me. Well, in fact, now when I talk, when I harp on the roles, the significance of the people's roles, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to shift the blame, mm -hmm. you know, to the people. Don't get me wrong. Now, but but again, we need to acknowledge the realities ahead mm -hmm. in our country. Now, we are still in the we are still in the face of uh, what I call ballot box democracy. Mm. Ballot box democracy. Mm. We only have our voice heard, or perhaps sometimes not even heard properly, mm. right? Once every four or five years. Mm. And, but at the same time, at the same time, it is our duty to initiate changes and demand for participatory democracy. Mm. And uh, certainly, there are many ways that we can do. Mm. It's not just that, that you know we rely on uh, maybe the local elections. Mm. I mean, local elections to me mm. uh, that has been dear to my heart, mm. even as early as 1990 mm. in the NECC. Uh, pardon me for uh, digressing. Mm. In the NECC, the National Economic Consultative Council, I said that, mm. and of course that raised the eyebrows of my mm. counterparts mm. Uh, within BN. Mm. Yeah? But at the same time, the uh, the people. I must say that the people, they. They should make their voice heard mm. by engaging the local councils, for instance, mm. to, to say the very least. Mm. And uh, not just that uh, we hope the legislators themselves mm. 
to do the uh, to uh, to spearhead mm. the protest or to spearhead the something mm. uh, dear to the heart, mm. the people themselves, mm. especially those who are more well informed mm. and more discerning, mm. they should be there mm. uh, to demand their rights mm. or to demand you know their voice heard mm. by the local councils. I mean that is the 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 lowest tier of government mm. that we are dealing with. How, how then do you feel about people expressing uh, and expressing their opinions through? Uh, rallies, for example, uh, and demonstrations. Well, in fact, there are many ways to skin a cat, as the saying goes. Of course, to uh, uh, to stage a protest in many advanced democracies, no big deal, I would say, no big deal. But in our country here, again, many a time people might make it an issue. I'm not trying to instigate any street protest or whatnot. Of course, many a time the authorities would argue that that would lead to unto an incident, right? Yes and no. But again, but again. Now, other than that, other than that, I presume there are many other viable alternatives that we can make our voice heard, or at least to register our protest, our concern, rather. I use the word concern, not necessarily be a protest at all times. Concern. Uh, yeah. One of the things I think that really has reached a pivot. Uh, and apogee is communal politics. Uh, in, on my own, you know, in, uh, um, in my own uh, observation, I think uh, communal politics does uh, lead to a certain kind of of sickness of the citizenry, if if you ask me. Uh, it's it's such a primitive way of dealing with with politics. But you know, that's the way the country has been was uh, uh, delineated. Uh, but we seem to arrive at a climax uh, where communal politics doesn't seem to operate anymore. Or it will continue to operate in the nonsensical way that it's doing uh, at, at, at present. Uh, after GE13, uh, if you look at the votes very carefully in Peninsula Malaysia, even the Malay vote, you could see a significant swing uh, to the other side. And essentially, it was a protest vote rather than one that. In the was... urban areas, in particular? Well, even in rural areas, if you look at the margins by which Southern areas, yes. many BN uh, uh, candidates uh, won, the, the, the majorities were very small. So, a very, very good look uh, would show a, a rather significant uh, shift. Um, but, um, you know, it seems to be people are questioning uh, communal politics, uh, communing, uh, questioning the interest of, of communal politics. And uh, ever since uh, GE13, uh, we, we look at communal political parties, yeah. and it seems that everybody is again not wanting to pay any attention to lessons that might be learned from the overall results, but really looking back again at party interests. Uh, you know, who's going to challenge me? And uh, um, and I think uh, uh, the party uh, you are a member of, the Malaysian Chinese Association, perhaps is a very good reflection of that kind of uh, navel gazing. In that there's so there's so much promise of you know self reflection and you know consultation and so on, but uh, what we see outside is a lot of fratricide, civil war. The great hallmark of the MCA over the past three decades uh, has been uh, you know personality uh, uh, clashes. Um, you know, uh, why are you still in that party? <laughs> Perhaps to certain quarters. They might attribute that to some kind of curse. I don't. I don't <laughs> think so. I beg to disagree. <laughs> but uh, based on my ex experience and uh, uh, my personal experience uh, as a member, mm. right from rank and file, right up to uh, the top slot mm. uh, as the president of the party, now I could see that by and large, by and large, uh, the root cause, the root cause is linked to the basic question as to whether the, the party is value-driven or interest-driven. Meaning, we have, uh, say, quite a sizable membership. Some might argue that that is the self-bloated membership. Some may not agree. Nonetheless, the question that we need to ask is, how many of us are indeed value-driven? When I say value-driven, mm. meaning we join the parties because we believe in the philosophy, mm. because we think that you know, the, the party constitution mm. you know, uh, is a guiding, provides us with a guiding principle mm. and nothing else. Or sometimes, or many a times, we might encounter cases where people, they join 
they choose to join certain political parties, not because of political belief. Mm. They know nothing about the political spectrum. To them, it's just short-term mm. interest-driven, be, be short-term interest-driven. Mm. And uh, that explains the most. Mm. So, in this case, coming back to your question, mm. so called the civil war, mm. yeah? The civil war or internal fight, mm. uh, that has been uh, in session mm. uh, for decades. Yes. Almost, uh, say, every 10 years, you could see uh, recurrence of the so-called factional fight with a new batch of uh, players, mm. right? Yeah, indeed, that is true. But again, you know, if we were to look at, we, if we were to take a close look at all of this so-called part of crisis, mm. perhaps one could easily trace, or one could easily conclude that, that all these so-called factional fights or what have you, in fact, are very much, are very much intertwined with the so-called in interests, mm. uh, interest, like factional interests, mm. or particular kind of interest, sectarian interests. Mm. Not so much on the philosophy. No, nothing, mm. nothing to do with that. Mm. Right. I mean, perhaps uh, that would help uh, explain, mm. you know, the general phenomenon mm. uh, of the so-called civil war mm. uh, within mm. MC. Mm. Yeah, but, and uh, I, I can assure you that. In fact, with due respect to other parties, uh, I must say that such, such kind of psyche you know, mm. seems to be prevalent mm. among all parties. Mm. It depend, but of course, it varies from party to party in terms of magnitude mm. and intensity mm. at different times. Mm. But it does exist. Mm. Uh, yes. Uh, and why are you in the party? <laughs> well, still. why am I still in the party? Why don't I opt out, right? Yes, and, and of course, would, yeah. And will you be uh, offering yourself uh, for the presidency, if, you know, in the next few months? Wow, that has yet to come across my mind. And just now, when uh, when our ladies, uh, when our lady from uh, Malaysia Kenya asked me the same question, uh -huh. well, I say that I don't have the answer. Mm. I don't have the answer yet. Not that I'm trying to, uh, uh, well, keep a tight lid over this issue, but rather. I, uh, I'm more concerned about a few things now mm. uh, bothering me and, uh, and the MC members at large, mm. or even the, the Malaysians, mm. uh, average Malaysians at large. Mm. Of course, people may say that, hey, we don't, we, I don't support a party, why should I bother mm. about the party, mm. whether or not it, it still remains uh, relevant or, mm. or otherwise. Mm. But don't ever forget that. I mean, whether we like it or we don't like it, mm. MC is some or other. I mean, it has been there for such a long time, and uh, certainly, it, it does have certain contributions. Mm. Of course, we can't survive forever on the past contributions, mm. contributions of yesteryears, mm. right? But uh, coming back to your question, interesting question, why don't I opt out mm. or why must I choose to stay mm. in the party? After all this, after all this is so-called, uh, uh, I call that political ordeal to me, mm. right? Mm. And why must I uh, stay on? Mm. Well, in the first place, I need to make my stand very clear. Mm. In 1981, way back in 1981, mm. when I graduated as a young engineer, mm. I chose to join a party mm. not because of anything. Mm. I chose a party because I was convinced by the party constitution, mm. especially the constitution laid by the founding fathers, mm. especially late Sir Tan Cheng Long. I'm not trying to be philosophical, but then uh, mm. that was a, the true story. I was convinced then. And of course, I was then highly critical mm. and sometimes even cynical of the party mm. uh, in 1981. Right. Again now, after having gone through all these uh, tribulations or political ordeal, if I, mm. I may call it, right, I don't call it quit mm. simply because I don't join the party because of certain individuals. Why must I quit because of certain individuals? Or just due to perhaps uh, the kind of shabby treatment given to me, mm. right? At this material time, mm. then I opt out? No, I don't think that uh, that is me. Certainly that is not my character. Mm. And I will certainly stay loyal. Mm. Stay loyal not to individuals, mm. not to leaders, but stay loyal to my principle. Mm. And also my principle must be people-centric. I'm not trying to be uh, what you call uh, uh, rhetorical, mm. but then uh, this is exactly what I have in mind. Do you, uh, do you believe that the age of communal politics is over? 
Yes, absolutely. And well, in fact, in the year 2009, uh, I did contemplate to, uh, uh, to initiate some changes, mm -hmm. uh, or at the very least, try to introduce some changes mm -hmm. uh, to the structure, to the party structure uh, that has been uh, mono-ethnic all this while. And uh, that explains why I mooted the idea of uh, uh, using the acronym MCA for Malaysia Communities Alliance. Actually, that was concocted by me then. Mm. Uh, certainly, I know that is, that is not going to be an easy task, mm. knowing very well that you are bound to have strong resistance from within, especially you know, from those uh, conservative, uh, conservatives within the party, mm. or even certain sectors within the Chinese community, mm. but uh, time has changed. Mm. And we need to, we need to envision mm. the future. Mm. And in your contact with MCA members, yeah. uh, especially since post G13, do you find that that's a common sentiment? Uh, no. Well, actually that varies from, uh, mm. uh, that varies from, uh, say, sectors to sectors, because uh, when I talk about sectors, of course, not that I'm trying to stratify, you know, mm. the Chinese community, mm. but by and large, I must say that the young people, the young voters, mm. the young voters, the young Chinese voters, in fact, they don't seem to bother much mm. about race-based okay. politics. To them, what has been there to their heart are the common issues, mm. the common issues like uh, uh, fighting corruption, mm. you know, uh, or even uh, or some. Uh, security problems, mm. right? You know, the escalating uh, crime rate, mm. and uh, sometimes even the local issues, mm. bread and butter issues, mm. and not so much on the, the race-based uh, race issues. Now, uh, how um, would you, one, one is, would you support uh, direct membership to the BN as one of the forms by which they can uh, perhaps reinvent themselves, and two, um, how would the MCA contribute towards, uh, you know, uh, uh, Barisan National as a party as compared to all these component parties? Well, when we talk about the direct membership of uh, BN, or prior to this, we had the Alliance, mm -hmm. Alliance Prikatan, mm -hmm. Alliance Direct Membership. That has been an age-old uh, uh, mm -hmm. discourse, right? Nothing new. Mm -hmm. But again, time and again, uh, at certain times, we like to resurrect mm. you know, this issue mm. for what it, whatever reasons best known to the leaders. Mm. But what is pertinent now, I could see that uh, ultimately we need to have a single party, mm. single party, whether we like it or we don't like it, mm. right? And of course, uh, when certain quarters propose to have a merger, mm. again, that is easier said than done because mm. that is going to involve a lot of uh, complications mm. like uh, party assets, mm. the, the structure of the membership, mm. right? Or even the, uh, the network of, uh, uh, say, grassroots mm. organization. Mm. All this actually uh, would add to the complexities of the problem. Yeah. Mm. But, uh, but certainly we need, to, we need to initiate from somewhere. Mm. We, we can't say that, hey, uh, that is something insurmountable. We yeah. just leave it aside forever. No. Yeah. But again, again, uh, you asked a very interesting question just now. You know whether or not, now whether or not, now this would uh, give BN say the uh, kind of a new vigor, mm. right? Mm. Yes and no. That depends not just on, you know, whether you are running as a single party, mm. a single uh, entity mm. with direct membership or otherwise. Mm. But rather, at the same time, we need to have a new mindset. We need to ensure that our mindset could uh, keep abreast with the changing times. Mm. I think that is most crucial, mm. rather than just uh, you know the structure or maybe you know the membership. Mm. Yeah, the other thing, um, of course, the common perception about the members of the coalition, yeah. uh, the MCA, the MIC, uh, uh, and the Gerakan, you know, people hardly think of these days. But uh, if you look at the two main uh, racially based component parties, the MCA and the MIC, of course the perception is that you are enfeebled, 
emasculated members of the coalition. Uh, is that just a fallacy, a misplaced perception? Well, I, we must admit that uh, that perception has been pervasive. Hmm. And many a times people could cite a lot of examples, a lot of uh, uh, real examples, as MC members. Of course, they do feel that one of the biggest, one of the biggest contributing factors that are leading to their electoral setback, of course, largely depends on, largely depends on the extent of latitude granted by AMNO, right, to all these uh, component parties on certain issues, especially issues uh, confronting their respective communities, right? Yes and no. Of course, on one hand, of course, uh, people may say that, hey, you can't expect the uh, uh, component parties, the component parties like MCA or MIC or even Graka, you know, to defend certain policies, certain policies that have been uh, unilaterally, uh, that have been uh, unilaterally uh, endorsed by, say, the biggest uh, component party that is AMRA. Right, without much consultation. People may have qualms over that, right? We could understand why. But at the same time, I think, uh, but let us be fair, we need to do some soul searching as well. Like for instance, in the case of other component parties, including MC, now we need to, act, to acknowledge, we need to acknowledge the inherent witnesses in our own structure, in our own network, our grassroots network. We used to claim that uh, we have about one million strong mm. membership. We have extensive uh, grassroots network. And that has been uh, one of the conducive factors, right? Uh, enabling MCA to have a good outreach mm. to the people those days. But now that we are facing the we are facing different set of problems. Now, because the same set of network, now, if remain, say, intact, now, without any empowerment, then you are bound to face, you are bound to face now, such problems as, uh, what you call uh, ineffective, ineffective representation at the local levels, or perhaps sometimes people don't even bother to seek help from them. That means to say they fail in the job, in engaging the people at the lowest level, at the, uh, the grassroots level. And all this actually now has been uh, the serious problems that MC has been grappling with. I mean, whether we, we like it or not, these are the hard facts. And uh, prior to general election, to, uh, prior to GE13, I could see that now, quite a number of these uh, uh, service centers or whatnot at the local level, mm. uh, they have been closed down. Mm. They have been closed down, mm. especially in the Pakatan health states. Mm. Not because they are getting nowhere. Mm. They were then getting nowhere. Mm. On one hand, of course, you know, they don't have the, uh, the, the councillorship anymore mm. in all these states. And on the other hand, on the other hand, mm. they, uh, they don't seem to know what are the new roles expected mm. from them, especially uh, by the people? Mm. Because all this while they've been uh, engaging, the, uh, they have been uh, embarking on the so-called the service-oriented, mm. the service-oriented work. But gone are the days. People, they don't just look at that. Mm. They want something more than that, something more than just uh, community service. Mm. You see that? Mm. Um, you know, It is. No, no, it's all right. Okay, I've got it. With the element of cynicism, mm -hmm. uh, the element of cynicism of the larger public uh, towards party politics uh, arises in the fact that you know they, they see little beyond uh, the jostling for positions in uh, uh, regular party politics. I think in two thousand, uh, following two thousand eight, uh, and your um, tenure as president of the uh, MCA. We arrived at a very interesting and ironical position because uh, there was a larger public outside of the party uh, that crossed uh, uh, races, crossed, crossed communities, 
who saw your presidency as um, you know something quite radical, actually, given your own uh, experience within the party. Uh, but you didn't succeed. Uh, uh, well, if I may, I mean, you did stay uh, on. Uh, make a correction. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, that happened in 2010. In 2010, 2010 yeah. yeah, yeah, but but I mean from 2008 onwards and your ascendancy up, yeah. uh, and but your tenure didn't last for very long, and so people fall back again uh, into this perception that essentially party politics, especially in the BN coalition, is all mafia and cabal, and basically really like these people are irredeemable. Uh, now, uh, you know, is party politics even as we know it today viable? This is indeed a very challenging question. <laughs> challenging, but oh, I, I love to answer. I love to answer, and uh, if I may share with you and all our friends here my little experience of failure. You know, people they like to to brag about their success stories, but uh, I don't think that I need to hide. You know, why I failed. <laughs> right. Of course, uh, people. You know, they, they call me by all kinds of names. No kind words, especially from my detractors and critics within the party. And they call me a loner, lone wolf, loose cannon, maverick, or maverick uh, yes, <laughs> maverick. Never mind. But, but of course, it's not, I need to, I need to clarify that nobody would ever want to be branded as a loner, more so in politics, because that largely depends on teamwork. Right, and uh, I am I'm of no exception. But the problem is, the problem is, when uh, you contest certain certain portfolio, certain seat in a party election, right, without any endorsement from the top brass, from the the party bosses, and you turn out to be the only winner from the uh, so-called the non-endorsed grouping, and certainly you are going to be the lone voice. Right, in the establishment, mm. in the leadership. Mm. And of course, under that kind of circumstances, if at all you insist on speaking up, speaking up your mind, and also you believe in the so-called independent-mindedness, mm. then certainly you have to pay a price for it. Mm. What kind of price? You need, I mean certainly you need to have uh, enough stamina mm. to withstand the kind of nonsense, what I call nonsense, mm. of being demonized mm. as a Lone Ranger, mm. Maverick, or what have you. Mm. This is what. And uh, way back in the year 2008, when I first ran for my party presidency, of course, I was then a reluctant candidate, mm. a reluctant candidate, because I didn't expect that mm. to happen so, so prompt. Mm. Immediately after I took over mm. the ministership, in MOT, mm. and you know very well the MOT, the Ministry of Transport, mm. was then, uh, uh, in a way, beleaguered mm. with all these issues, mm. like uh, the PKFZ, yes, yes. or even the Pusparkom issue, so on and so forth, mm. just to name a few, mm. right? And I, I call myself a reluctant candidate, anyway. I contested and I won, mm. right? But the problem is, I entered the race without a, a lineup something unorthodox mm. to many in party insiders. Mm. And uh, I turned out to be the winner. Mm. Where else? The rest of the, uh, the leadership, the, mem the other members of the leadership, of mm. course, they have their own uh, factional mm. affiliation mm. in one way or another. Mm. And of course, that explains why later on, mm. you know, when I insisted on, say, some of the changes mm. in the name of reform, mm. just to name a few, like, uh, my insistence on the direct, mem the direct election mm. for all the top, all the uh, office barrels mm. in uh, CWC, the mm. Central Working Committee. Mm. That was one, one of the key issues mm. dear to my heart. Second, of course, was the uh, re-registration mm. of members mm. in order to stamp out the phantom, the mm. phantom members once and for all. Mm. That raised many eyebrows within the party leadership, and that explained. Partly, not solely, my fault, mm. right? And of course, at the same time, you know, friends and foes alike, mm. they would say that, hey, you are, 
you were then overly, uh, you were then over ambitious mm. by opening up too many, too many better fronts mm. at one go. Mm. On one hand, you want to initiate changes, drastic changes within the party, mm. and on the other hand, you were then opening up a can of worms, mm. especially in exposing or perhaps uh, in uh, commissioning a thorough investigation into the PKZ scandal. Mm. Of course, all this happened at the same time. It's not that I want to, uh, to brag about it, but these are the hard facts, mm. the, the true facts mm. uh, that have been uh, bothering me at that material time. And uh, one uh, major mistake or blunder, I would call it my major blunder, mm. that I shouldn't have made mm. was I, I thought that perhaps uh, by uh, disturbing the hornet's nest, at the very most, I had only three years mm. for me to, uh, to clean up, mm. to finish my job, mm. three years. Mm. Why three years? Because three years later, there might be a, a, a fresh party election mm. as well as general election. Mm. And that might be the time for me to say goodbye mm. to everybody. Mm. Knowing very well that, that might be my swan song, mm. right? And uh, I told myself, or even, uh, even my family members, mm at most three years down the road, mm. I'm going to wrap it up, right? Mm. And that will be the end of my political career. Mm. I said that. But little did I expect that hardly one year later, mm. uh, hardly one year, mm. right? Of course, I felt the, the pinch. Mm. I felt the heat. Mm. Of course, you know what I mean, mm. right? And that was the beginning of uh, trouble. Mm. And, uh, and uh, thereafter, of course, you know what happened to me. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then, of course, most recently, uh, prior to GE13, yeah. because uh, your candidacy was very eagerly debated uh, by lots of people. Uh, you know, there were rumors that uh, Dr. Srinajib would uh, put you as a candidate, as a as a as a direct member of uh, direct candidate of the of the BN. Uh, there was also talk that uh, um, basically you might jump yeah. uh, to the other side, or, or most credibly that you might stand as an independent none of which happened. Uh, and for the general public, of course, again, with the disillusion with party politics and the way people do things, nobody can understand why, logically, they didn't put you, because, you know, at the very least, you would have given Rafizi a very heavy fight. Uh, you had the support of many of, 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 your, of your constituents, uh, and yet you were not placed. So what kind of logic in politics is there in this party? Well, of course, when, when everybody uh, was so engrossed uh, in talking about winning candidates, winning candidates, of course, me too, I was then hopeful of getting the, uh, the seat as an incumbent. I mean, that is quite natural, yeah? And more so, I put in a lot of effort in the past four years, or five years, rather, five years, five solid years. And uh, three years, of course, without the uh, ministerial post, I still spend my own money, my own resources, uh, to run my service centre. Certainly, I, I, uh, uh, I would believe that uh, BN leadership, of course, you know, uh, might look into that, might take that into consideration, despite the fact that uh, uh, my candidature was indeed was indeed in jeopardy mm. uh, ever since the party president announced it mm. openly mm. that I would be ex, mm. right? But I, uh, it, it was not my intention to pick uh, a quarrel with anybody, mm. much less with him as the president, because after all, the president uh, has the prerogative. Mm. Uh, but along the way, along the way. In fact, when the BN top brass, they were then negotiating about the seat allocation or seat swap, or even, or even the you know, the who are the uh, so-called winning candidate choice of candidates. Certainly, I was nobody to get myself involved. Mm. I I was then uh, no longer the president. Mm. Yeah, and more so, more so. At that juncture, of course, uh, a lot of rumours mm. 
a lot of rumors speculating that perhaps, uh, you know, uh, Ong Ti Kiat would, uh, would hop the party, mm. would join the opposition, mm. you know, would run as an, as an independent candidate, mm. so on and so forth. But to tell the truth, given the benefits of hindsight, mm. I came to realize that actually all this smoke screen, I call that, mm. was deliberately created by two groups of people. Mm. One, of course, from within the party, mm. those who really want to put me in a quandary, mm. right, for obvious reasons. And on the other hand, of course, my friends over the other side of the divide, of course, mm -hmm. they also want to, mm. to confuse the, the party bosses mm. of PN. And uh, certainly that is going to cause a dent on my mm. so-called credibility, unreliable candidates, so to speak. I could understand the kind of side war, mm. right, uh, initiated by them. But, uh, but at the same time, of course, there, there had been uh, two different schools of uh, gossip mm. uh, prevalent mm. within the circle, within the political circle, mm. or even in the market. I, I presume you might have heard of that. Mm. First, of course, people talk about, uh, they, 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 they talk about the, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, tendering of resignation mm. by party president. Mm. Uh, MCS party president, mm. in the events that OTK was fielded as candidate, as candidate yeah. right? That was one school of thought, uh, one school of uh, uh, gossip. And the other one was, the other one was the uh, giving up of three constituencies, mm. parliamentary constituencies, mm. in exchange for the total acceptance yeah. of the MCA's list yes. for Slango candidates, yes, yes. in particular Pantan. Of course, People talk about it. Mm. But how far is that true? I wouldn't know. Mm. I mean, to tell you the truth, I wouldn't know because I was not at all uh, involved in the process of negotiating mm. uh, or finalizing mm. the candidates. If I may, you know, just have a. Uh, this is very baffling to me because I really don't understand why you stay in the party. So I'm just going to ask the question again, but in a kind of virtual way, a, a virtual exercise. Uh, if you look at the opposition, if you look at young people who are entering politics, for example, you look at impressive young people who have a very firm set of principles, who have vision. You're talking people like Wong Chen, who's a friend of mine. You're talking about people like Surendra. You're talking about people like Zairil K. Johari, Stephen Sim, and all that. They're, they're all on the other side. What really, at the three, stops you from taking the lead? Uh, well, of course, it's good to, uh, to see good people. Mm. Uh, or quality people uh, from both sides of the divide mm. yeah, to dominate the political scene. But that is quite difficult to come by, of course. Mm. But answering your question, why don't I hop? Mm. Right. Take the leap <laughs> rather than hop. <laughs> hop is not a good word. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, to me, understanding the, uh, the kind of political scenario uh, on the other side of the divide, of course, I do have friends mm. uh, uh, who are the staunch mm. supporters or political players mm. yeah, uh, in the opposition camp. Mm. I don't deny that. Certainly, I know there are problems as well. Mm. Despite the fact that I choose not to brag about it in the mm. open, I don't think it's ethical for me mm. to brag about it, you know, just, just because I want to cause a dent mm. on their credibility, mm. right? I choose not to do that. Mm. But in short, in short, in my mind, I do understand. Pastures over the other side of the divide, in fact, are not at all that rosy. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm. Suffice to say that. But I never want to brag about it in the, in the open. Mm. Why should I in the first place? Mm. To me, I would call that unethical. Mm. But of course, if you want to engage in any debate, on issues or on policies, mm. then that is a different matter altogether. We are now 51%, uh, 49%, basically a minority government. How do you think we are coping with it? Well, when we, we are in such a position, I would call that something unprecedented, mm. unprecedented in terms of uh, 
the magnitude of challenges uh, with the ever escalating mm. uh, demands of the people. Mm. Of course, this is no easy task uh, for BN government. Mm. I mean, the ruling party. The ruling party. You have to face all this, yeah, with a lot of brickbats mm. for whatever things you do. I could understand that, and more so you have your own set of problems mm. to grapple with, mm. right? The internal problems, and uh, if at all you want to embark on transformation, mm. you need to overcome all this internal resistance, mm. right? But uh, but at the same time, at the same time, if I may say, yeah, if I may say that. Uh, uh, the ruling party at this juncture mm. must be willing to engage the opposition coalition mm. in many respects. Meaning, it's time for us. It's time for us now to make issues dear to the heart of the people. Mm bipartisan. Mm. That means to say we should engage them mm. in real sense. Mm. We should engage them positively mm. and not just for cosmetics mm. purposes. And this is a time where you know, the ruling party uh, or the ruling coalition mm. they could show mm. their latitude of uh, tolerance mm. yeah, by engaging the opposition mm. people, or the opposition MPs, the opposition camps mm. now into into not just a political discourse, mm. but rather sometimes mm. even uh, on issues like uh, uh, on things like uh, uh, policy making. Mm. It's nothing wrong for us mm. to hear them out. Mm. I see no reason why we should shut the doors to them. If, uh, say, for instance, uh, when I mean during my MOT days, of course. I used to practice that, you know, before we implemented you know, certain projects like uh, the RRT, for instance, mm. the RRT. Mm. We walk an extra mile by engaging the people, mm. the local communities. We give them, we gave them the latitude, we gave them the latitude mm. to voice their concern. Mm. Say, within the period of three months, mm. three months, they could voice their concern mm. or even their objection. And all this got to be taken into consideration mm. in the decision making. Mm. And likewise, I think we should do the same mm. uh, on other matters, mm. other macro issues. Mm. I see no reason why we can't do it. I've got two final questions. Are we opening to the floor? Okay. Uh, I've got two final questions. They are very much about, uh, about you and the situation. But before that, uh, talking about uh, the government trying to, um, yeah, looking at bipartisan relations and so on. Uh, you know, in the past six months, I, I don't know how much you know about this, but perhaps you could give your opinion on it. One, why is the Prime Minister so quiet? And two, why is Dr. Mahade so loud? <laughs> what is happening? Uh, to tell the truth, ever since I left the corridors of power, I don't seem to get uh, all these uh, so-called juicy stories or even uh, uh, so-called up-to-date information, mm -hmm. especially information on some of these uh, uh, big-time politicians. Mm -hmm. And many a time, you know, just like any others, any others uh, at the grassroots level, mm -hmm. a lot of hearsay mm -hmm. uh, has been bombarding us, of course, hearsay. But how far is that true? We wouldn't know, right? We wouldn't know. But I'm not asking for gossip, I'm asking, what do you make of it? Uh, well, at this juncture, of course, I think uh, it's, a, uh, it's a crucial period where the leadership, our, our uh, nation's leadership, of course, uh, they need to put their foot down uh, with the visible determination and political will in combating the various, I mean, the uh, a wide uh, spectrum of uh, issues ranging from uh, security mm. and, uh, to uh, fighting corruption, mm. right? And so on and so forth. And all this actually needs the uh, attention and, uh, and even sometimes or many a times direct intervention mm. of the top men.
of the Prime Minister. Mm. Of course, our past Prime Minister, mm. uh, Tunem, of course, mm. uh, like any other people, any other citizens, certainly he has uh, the fundamental right of speaking up his mind. Whether we like it or we don't like it is a different matter. But we need to respect uh, his views. Yeah. Many a time we might beg to disagree, mm. right? But it doesn't mean that we should, we should suffocate him mm. from uh, speaking up. Mm. I mean, that is my take. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, to, to draw everything back, and this is be my final question. Yeah. Uh, basically, uh, we are in a situa uh, situation where I think the country is seized by a sense of uncertainty. Uncertainty in the sense that, uh, as I said, uh, you know, there is wanton uh, use of laws like sedition. Uh, there are at the same time uh, uh, calls for the return of the ISA. There seems to be no real rigorous sense of uh, making sense of a new political landscape. Instead, it seems, uh, again, it's a free for all, and in my view, a kind of free fall. Now, where does a person like uh, you fit in? And how do you think you could influence anything at all? Uh, and by that uh, uh, matter, do you think a progressive politics is possible in, in Malaysia? Certainly me alone can't do anything. Uh, one man's effort would forever be insignificant in initiating changes. Right? I think everybody would agree on that. But it doesn't mean that that we should call it quit. I won't give up just because I feel that I'm all alone. Perhaps my role is far too insignificant, more so after my exit from the cabinet, the federal cabinet. I don't think that way. What I believe in is when we talk about bipartisan, uh, bipartisan or bipartisan politics, of course, what I would expect, what I would anticipate is at the very least we should have Good people, quality people. I'm, I'm not saying that I'm good people. I'm expecting or anticipating quality people. Yeah. Be given a place in all these parties across the political divide. And let them have a role to play. And perhaps ultimately, you know, a role to dominate the political scene or to initiate changes. And uh, when we talk about bipartisan politics or bipartisan politics, of course, we need to have good sparring partners, and not just and not the kind of so-called lopsided support mm. for one side, right, at the expense of another, uh, at the expense of the other, mm. and uh, that is something unhealthy to me. Now, because we wouldn't want to see that you know, you know, we swing from one end to the other, mm. and uh, and what would we gain? As a voter, because we what we want to see is check and balance, and that explains the uh, the very reason why you know a lot of us now we have been talking, we have been yearning for by coalition politics. Mm. Is that right? Mm. Yeah. And uh, go back to the basics. Mm. And uh, certainly, when you talk about a progressive politics, I'm still hopeful of pro progressive politics. Mm. But progressive politics wouldn't come automatically. Progressive politics be depends, on, depends on what kind of politicians we have. And uh, the kind of politicians we have certainly would be born out of the kind of electors that we have. If we have discerning, more discerning electors or voters, certainly we are going to raise a bar for, uh, we are going to raise a bar for those politicians from any parties, right? Who are ready to serve us as the as the working riot, as a people's representative in the legislature, and we want that to happen. And certainly, we Malaysians we deserve more than what we are having now. And that is my take. Thank you. That is I'm going to open up the floor just for a few questions. Uh, have we got anyone with questions? No. <laughs> yeah. That's three by me. Uh, I noticed that you wrote in your blog, and it hasn't been updated for some of you, that you like the romance of the three kingdoms, the water market, and the 
lot of reference to the uh, Chinese vocal history. You left out Sun Yat-sen. In, in my opinion, after talking to you for a while, I really feel that you are someone that resembles a lot of characteristics and traits. What are your thoughts about you know, Sun Yat-sen being someone who is quite an insurmountable obstacle feel Uh, thank you uh, for your gentle reminder. Well, in fact, uh, not that I didn't update my blog. Well, in fact, when, when I was interviewed by certain Chinese language dailies uh, on my favorite, favorite books, of course, I enumerated a quite a number, especially the uh, classic novels. And Chinese language, as you know very well, that has always been my first language. Okay? And uh, to answer your question on uh, Dr. Sun Yat Sen, true enough, uh, he is my so called uh, uh, idol, right? Uh, in addition to Mahatma Gandhi. So there are two, there are two here Dr. Sun Yat Sen and Mahatma Gandhi. And then coming back to Dr. Sun Yat Sen, knowing very well that he had to go against all odds at that material time, especially now after, after 1906, if my memory were to serve me right, yeah, after 1906, now, now he had been uh, attempting uh, to stage a few rounds of uh, a few rounds of uh, uprising uprising against the Manchus, but to no avail, right? And uh, I, still could, uh, I still could remember, you know, perhaps uh, some of the uh, uh, past history of his, uh, his uh, fundraiser initiatives in Malaya, British Malaya, right? Including Penang and uh, Kuala Lumpur, yeah. Of course, that, that was part of history. I'm not going to uh, deep dive into it, right? But uh, Suffice to say that, uh, as a politician, of course, as a politician, I have high respect, high, high regards for him, not because uh, he was the founder of Republic of China, the first ever republic in Asia, but because of his, uh, his courage, courage of going against all odds. When uh, the Manchu government, the Qing dynasty, put a price on his head at that material time. And more so among the overseas Chinese, so to speak, many of the tycoons, the tin miners, in fact, they didn't seem to be convinced by his notion, by his ideal of uh, initiating uh, such, a, such an uprising against uh, the monarchy. Because to them, uh, that, is tantamount to, that is tantamount to capital punishment. And nobody would ever want to touch on that. You see that? I mean, this is my uh, my brief uh, uh, my brief take now on your question. I don't know exactly. Uh, you know, uh, perhaps Jack, you might have something more than that to ask. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, a lot of you you mentioned a few times you perceived that a lot of failure. The word failure comes up. But I suppose. Uh, yeah, because uh, because on top of that, uh, Dr. Sun Yat Sen uh, did harp on. Uh, one rare virtues, I use the word virtues, among the politicians of the day. He said, now we should endeavor, we should endeavor now to, uh, uh, to initiate big deeds, D-E-E-D, -E -E deeds, rather than harboring ambition of becoming a top Mandarin, a top Mandarin now in the civil service or in politics. That is what he, has been, he had been harping on now even before his departure. Yeah, I still remember that. Anyone else? Uh, yeah. What do you think, um, in your opinion, yeah. would be the implication towards the Chinese community? Without representations uh, of uh, Chinese ministers in our cabinet. Uh,
I think before I answer your question, of course, we need to uh, uh, look at this from uh, at least two aspects. Yeah. Firstly, of course, I think the basic question we need to ask is, now, when we talk about Chinese representation, of course, we need to look at the, the effectiveness. Effectiveness of Chinese representation. Effective in what sense? Effective in articulating the aspirations, aspirations of the community. Of course, this, this might sound a little bit communal, but uh, bearing in mind that until today, our kind of politics, not that I concur with it, but then uh, we have to live with the kind of uh, realities, our kind of politics, whether at the federal level or even at the state level, is still very much, is still very much commun communally compartmentalized, meaning they would expect you as the uh, so-called ethnic Chinese minister to bring up your so-called Chinese issues, right, and vice versa. And uh, that explains why even in the state of Penang, not that I want to drag in Pakistan, even in the state of Penang or even Islamo, you could see very well, you know, uh, that uh, even Pakistan, they, of course, they, they say that we are not uh, communal based, we are not race based, but again, you know, in the appointment, in the political appointment of uh, uh, deputy chief ministers, they need to have the, the DCM1, right, DCM2, right, based on race. I mean, this has been something deeply entrenched, and I do hope that one fine day we can do away with all this. When we call ourselves Malaysians, so be it. All issues are Malaysian issues, okay? Of course, that sounds a little bit uh, too, uh, what you call, uh, too idealistic. But coming back to, to the question, your question, other than effectiveness, of course, I think uh, another uh, major consideration now would be would be uh, now what kind of what kind of leaders, what kind of uh, so-called ethnic Chinese leaders that we need in cabinet? What kind of leaders? Now, do we do we choose our so-called our ethnic Chinese leaders based on party hierarchy? or otherwise. This has always been the, the same old question asked. Not because whether you like it or not, you know, over the years, MCA, uh, having claimed as the, uh, the custodian of the Chinese rights in the federal government and the state government, of course, now you are bound to, you are bound to appoint your party leaders from number one. There is the president, then the deputy president, the secretary general, right? And uh, you are right up to vice president. It depends on the number of slots that you are given, right, to fill up the ministerial posts. So, again, again, that is quite tricky. That's why this round, I mean, come this round when uh, uh, the Sri Najib appointed Paul Lau, yeah, a non-partisan, uh, to, be, to be one of the ministers uh, from NGO, of course. Now, that raise, I mean, uh, that raised a concern now among the Chinese space parties. Because for the first time, for the first time, we are having such a new scenario, a new scenario where a non-partisan, a non-partisan was appointed to the cabinet, and uh, Paul, at the first instance, he declared, I'm here not to represent the Chinese. He said that, you see that. And of course, that seemed to have created some kind of uh, Perception, I call that perception that uh, there's a vacuum, there's a vacuum uh, for Chinese representation in the cabinet. But again, to the Chinese, the general, pe the general public, of course, certain quarters would argue that what we want is quality representation, effectiveness of the Chinese ranks in the cabinet. And some of them, they might even, they might even go one step further by, by argue that by arguing that. Why should we stress on that? We should be Malaysian at heart. And uh, we would expect other ministers from AMNO or other parties to voice out our concerns as well. So you see that there, this has been uh, what you call some of the, uh, the basic uh, issues bo uh, bothering us, especially when we talk about the absence of Chinese representation in the present cabinet. So certain degree of anxiety uh, is prevalent, of course. I mean, we have to acknowledge that. But at the same time, I think it's time for us 
to rethink the two fundamental questions that I ask, that I pose. Effectiveness, mm. as well as, you know, Quality. who are there to represent us? Mm. If you want to, to harp on so-called Chinese representation. Yes, sir. Uh, Siri, yep. you know, after the G13, I think Tusan asked the question, Pelagi uh, China Mao, right? Um, what do you think the Chinese in Malaysia want? That's the first question. Second question, what do you think they should be wanting or asking for? When we talk about the aspirations uh, of certain, of a particular community, of course, uh, this is going to be, this is going to be uh, a fairly interesting, uh, fairly interesting topic. Uh, to discuss, and also at the same time, there's no such thing as uh, simple answers. No such thing as simple answers to the question. Upper Chinamo, yeah. Upper Chinamo, of course, uh, that really uh, ruffled a lot of feathers within the community. Of course, I could understand that, but uh, it depends on the tone you ask a question. Of course, some people might have asked that in a very defined manner. Uh, but out there, there are friends of mine, there are friends of mine uh, who are not, who are non-Chinese, of course. They pose the same question, but in a, in a, a relatively friendly manner. In fact, they too are eager to know exactly what you guys are uh, aspiring or what you guys are, are yearning for. Again, I told them, there's no such thing as a standardized answer. But again, you know, the common concerns about ethnic Chinese here, just like any other Malaysians. In fact, in fact, we want to see that the nation be on the right track. We talk about fighting corruption. I think that is above race-based politics. We talk about security. I think taxpayers, in all fairness, taxpayers deserve a, safe, a safer place to live in, right? And also we talk about, say, efficient, uh, efficient governance provided by the state, uh, federal, the state, and, and even the local government. And all these are pertinent, are relevant. And uh, I don't think that these are the excessive demands. And these are not the communal base issues. And uh, when the, those who are politically motivated asking such a question, of course, they might have their agenda. They might have their agenda. They might have their preset minds, their preset minds, and uh, to certain, certain people, especially those uh, who are linked to the uh, corridors of power, they might think that uh, since since uh, BN under the stewardship of Dr. Sri Najib uh, had been doing quite a fair bit uh, to uh, carry favor the Chinese, to the extent of uh, even ruffling a lot of feathers within their own party, their own community. Why in the first place? This is not, this was not reciprocated by the Chinese voters through ballot box. That's why earlier on I did mention that, you know, that the Sri Najib might be quite uh, frustrated or perhaps uh, disappointed with the kind of electoral outcome, especially um, from among the Chinese voters. I did say that. But uh, to say the, the very least, I must say that uh, gen generally, ethnic Chinese here, Ch ethnic Chinese Malaysians, they are not power hungry. In fact, when they, they state their claims, it's not that uh, they want something excessive just for their own race at the expense of others. I don't believe that. Far from it. And no right-thinking Malaysian would ever want to conquer with the kind of uh, so-called excessive demands. Uh, but why in the first place certain quarters they deliberately they choose to distort or to uh, demonize of course they should, they, they should know what their agenda is. But to put the blame squarely not on a particular race for not supporting uh, the government of the day I think is a little bit too far-fetched and that doesn't do us anything good. That is tantamount to doing a disservice 
to the national reconciliation, uh, as what the Prime Minister had said earlier. I mean, this is my, uh, my gut feeling. Um, I think I'd ask also, what do you think the Chinese community should aspire towards increasingly? Well, in fact, I, uh, I would... Uh, I'm just thinking aloud. In fact, now, what we want is to see that everybody, everybody, irrespective of creed, colors, and race, and religion, now, we should have an equal opportunities, equal opportunities to excel and to compete. I think that is crucial. And that is different from so-called uh, uh, equal outcome. There's no such thing as equal outcome, because that depends on uh, individuals' efforts, how, how much effort you put in in order to, uh, uh, in order to produce a desired result. It's more on equal opportunities to excel and to compete. There was a question at the back, I think. Yes. Uh, Dr. Sri, uh, I understand that you have been following the thoughts of Saint Yun Master, uh, and uh, actually, you know, uh, actually, what could you bring learn from you to start on this idea uh, and really, uh, and really apply it to uh, apply this thought into politics? Especially, you have been through the ups and downs. Yeah. Thank you for your question and your observation. Uh, Sing Yun, of course, Master Sing Yun is my. Buddhist master. I'm his disciple. Uh, I'm not trying to uh, propagate anything here, uh, much less uh, preaching, <laughs> being the uh, so-called so -called, uh, religious preaching here. Uh, but to answer your question, of course, one thing I learned from him, even when I made my exit from Federal Cabinet, uh, unceremoniously, right, in June 2010, I go to bite the bullet. I go to bite the bullet, and uh, I was thinking, how, how am I going to serve the people? It's not just the people in Pandan who elected me, but also at the same time, I should have other roles to play, other than the so-called the political OTK. Yeah? There should be a different facet of my my endeavor, and that explains why I embark. Uh, quite aggressively and proactively on uh, on this uh, so-called mobile clinic service throughout the nation. And I did that not because of political mileage or whatever, far from it. Actually, I did that because I believe certainly I have different roles to play while I was then in political wilderness. You know, something uh, apart from politics. Politics is not the entirety of my life. Just like, uh, you know, when I pursue my hobby as a creative writer in Chinese language, I, uh, because those days I produce even TV drama scripts and all that. Uh, well, not that I'm trying to blow my trumpet, but then, uh, you know, that's my hobby anyway. That's my hobby, and until today, I, I still pursue that kind of hobby, right? Of course, now that I spend more time on the political commentaries, and uh, occasionally I did it in Bahasa yeah. yes. and, uh, and English as well. Yeah. But uh, time is a constraint. I have a question to ask you, actually. Yeah. Do you translate? Uh, well, in fact, on and off, I prefer to do my own translation. But, but, yeah. but of course, I, I, I understand that I myself sometimes might be uh, a little bit, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, I wouldn't say overly discerning. Uh, over the quality of translation, especially, especially when we come to, uh, you know, certain things uh, deep ex abstract mm. in politics, mm. in political commentaries, mm. you can't exactly, you know, ex expect others to read your mind, and and because they might have their own, uh, their own experience yes. in life, yes. they wouldn't have gone through your own experience, yes. so you can't really expect much yes. from others, right? But uh, I did have my uh, literary works mm. be translated into Basa Malaysia mm. uh, for Dewan Basa. Mm. Right. <laughs> okay, anyone with a uh, concluding question? Last question. How do you see MCA evolving with the major erosions uh, from uh, China's involvement? 
Well, I think the, uh, of course, everybody is now making all sort of uh, speculations about the uh, future of MCA, whether it would be uh, kept afloat or otherwise, or going to be Titanic, all right? I mean, this is uh, a mind-boggling issue now, but largely it depends on, largely it depends on our members. Members, it depends on what you want, because our system here, I mean, despite the fact that I tried to push hard uh, for direct election, right? That means to say every valid registered MC member has the right to vote if that were to come true. But unfortunately, uh, that was not implemented. Uh, that was uh, aborted, you know, following my, uh, uh, my forum, my political forum. So now we, we, we are still adhering to the existing delegate system, meaning it depends on how we, what kind of delegates we choose, and the delegates in turn, they would determine the kind of leaders that we have. That means to say, the, the plight and future of the party would largely rest on the 2,400 plus strong uh, delegates in MC. So after the, uh, the first round, the branch election, uh, well, it's still too early, too premature uh, to make any judgment or to, to, to do any observation at this juncture. Um, we're going to conclude, but maybe I could ask you just one uh, last kind of practical question. Uh, you know, I was just talking to a friend the other day who's very much involved in politics, a highly urbane and uh, intelligent person uh, who unfortunately lost uh, in Hulu Slango. But uh, he, he, he basically encapsulated the, uh, the climate of politics today as basically very dangerous rise of, and he used the word fascisms of various kinds, uh, pockets all over the place. Uh, I know you were involved with Tanku Razali and uh, that, uh, that Subramaniam uh, uh, and a few others in... in Amana. Yes, Amana, in trying to uh, create, call for again, national renewal, national reconciliation. Uh, can you tell us what happened to that effort? Because it didn't seem to go very far. And two, if we were to do that today, how would we go about it? Um, thank you for your concern over the future of Amana, mm. or what has been uh, uh, ordering Amana yes. uh, in the past two years. Uh, indeed, Amana uh, has been uh, uh, I must say that it has been uh, put to test, severe tests, ever since its inception two years ago. And uh, the first political ordeal, or rather the, the first ordeal confronting Amana was uh, the contemplation by certain activists within, the, within its fold uh, to push for transformation from being an NGO mm. to a political oh, party. party. And that was defeated, of course. And that also resulted in the exodus of uh, uh, certain leaders, certain leaders and their followers. Mm. Of course, that was the first ordeal, I use the word ordeal, yeah, confronting Amana. But uh, thereafter, of course, uh, Amana somehow has been viewed with suspicion, especially knowing very well that Amana, Amana's membership comprises uh, quite a number of political figures and political have been, right? From both sides of the divide, from Pakatan as well, as well as from BN. And uh, at one stage, it was viewed with uh, such a suspicion that People, pe people, they even s spun the story that uh, Amana might fill its candidates mm. in GE13. But of course, that did not come true. And that would never come true because knowing very well that Amana was formed as an NGO, not a political party. Right? So, if we were to pursue, if we were to pursue uh, the national renewal, I could foresee that this is indeed going to be a highly challenging mm. task. I wouldn't call it a tall order, mm. but certainly, certainly 
we need to mobilize the masses. We can't just we can't just rely on cert certain the so-called luminaries or big time politicians or political habits. I don't think that is sufficient. We need to drive home certain messages, clear messages now to the people at the grassroots level. No doubt it is just an NGO. It is not a party. But again, we need to make it people friendly and people centric.